Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 162nd Commission meeting of the Tennessee Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations, or TASSER. We're delighted you're here, and we appreciate all our members being here. Uh, thank you for being here. And we will uh, call your attention to the agenda on tab one, the minutes of June 22. Uh, the chair detects a quorum, um, I might add. And I, 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 if there's no objection, then we'll let the minutes stand as approved. Is there any question? Take a minute and look over them. Is there any question about the minutes? I don't think there are, and so unless, without being no objective, the meetings, the minutes of the June 22nd, June 2022 meeting stand as approved. And I'll defer to Dr. Lippert, our director, for his commission and staff update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, starting with the, the commission update and starting with uh, some sad news, and, and I'm sure yeah. a number of you have already heard that uh, on August 22nd, uh, Dr. Harry A. Green, who the first and longtime executive director of, of TASSER, passed away. Um, like I said, Harry was our executive director from, well, he was actually the first employee of the commission when it was created in 1978 and then became the, the executive director from 1981 until his retirement in 2012 and was, a, I think you could easily say, a force in, in state public uh, and local policy in Tennessee. Mm -hmm responsible for the creation of the fiscal capacity formula that we still use even going forward in the, in the, the TISA model, uh, active in a number of other uh, initiatives over the years, uh, the infrastructure inventory, uh, our, um, the creation of the Tennessee Emergency Communications Board was largely uh, work that Harry initiated. So uh, a, re a remarkable public servant. And if, with your uh, uh, approval, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have just a moment of silence in, in honor of Dr. Green. Yes. Thank you. And, and for your uh, reference, uh, members in the docket book, there is a copy of the Senate Joint Resolution uh, that uh, was passed uh, upon the occasion of, of Dr. Green's retirement back in 2012, and it highlights all his, his autobiographical information. Uh, moving on, uh, just a, a quick update for the members on the commission and, and staff's work related to the fiscal capacity formula as, as we uh, transition from the, the basic education program to the to TISA. Uh, we have been uh, meeting with the, the State Board of Education, the State Department, the Comptroller's Office, and with the uh, University of Tennessee CBER uh, on the mechanics of how that transition is going to work because there are some new reporting steps that are that are different than there were under the BEP and new, new approval processes. We are working up some analysis for uh, for the group on potential changes to our fiscal capacity formula. These are some of the changes that were re recommended by the commission back in our 2020 report. Um, it, it, this is very much the beginning of the process and it's gonna have to work work through uh, with the comptroller and, and the board and department before we actually do make any changes. But I just wanted to keep you aware that we are in the process of those meetings and if, if there are any updates, I'll, I'll provide them at a future meeting. And that's, that's it for the commission update. I do have a few staff updates, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, where is Michael Mount? Michael, if you could stand, please. So you all uh, know Michael Mount from, uh, from his past fiscal capacity updates as well as all the other reports he's worked on. Michael is, uh, is one of our go-to people behind the scenes uh, working on a, a number of other projects beyond, beyond what you see him present here. And in recognition of, of his, uh, his hard work and his potential for further excellence, we promoted Michael uh, this uh, past month from uh, research manager to research director. So he's now one of our four research directors. So if you join me in congratulating yes. Michael. And then uh, next is um, our information technology manager, Mark Patterson. Mark could not be with us here today. I believe he's watching remotely, probably from somewhere near exit 12 on Briley Parkway 
No. Uh, the staff gets it. Uh, it he, uh, Mark, uh, is uh, is also integral to everything we do. The the or his information technology. I mean, we literally could not do uh, most of our work without without Mark keeping our systems up and running. And he's done a lot of the. A, he uh, working with Teresa have, have done a lot of the work to make our fiscal capacity presentation, our county profiles, all that all that data more uh, visually. Uh, accessible and appealing. So uh, Mark has achieved 20 years of service with the state of Tennessee, and, and this took him a little while because he kind of bounced back and forth between the state and, and metro government. So he's probably got, um, we'll just say, more than 20 years experience combined. Uh, but I just uh, want to congratulate Mark on, on this achievement as well. And then uh, I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing two new staff members to the commission. Uh, we recently uh, hired two new staff members, including Senior Research Associate Kevin McCarthy and Research Associate Mamie Dankwa. Uh, Kevin has a Master's of Public Administration degree from Florida State University and a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of South Florida. He also has several years of government experience, and most recently as a Planning Associate with the City of Columbia. Uh, Columbia. Uh, Mamie is a recent graduate of East Tennessee State University, where she earned a Master of Public Health degree. So please join me in welcoming Kevin and Mamie to the commission. If you two could please stand, please. And Mr. Chairman, that completes the staff and commission update. Uh, th thank you, for, uh, Director Lippard. Are there any questions to the director uh, regarding his report? There being none, then I will ask the uh, commission members to turn to tab three on our agenda, the post-award and implementation process for state grants. And uh, uh, we have a draft report for review and comment today, uh, uh, which will be presented by Mr. Chris Belden, one of our research associates. I will you recognize Mr. Belden for your presentation, sir. All right, uh, thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Chris Belden, and today I will present the draft report on the post-award and implementation process for state grants for your re review and comment. The final report will be presented for your approval at the December meeting. This report was prepared in response to a request from Chairman Yeager, which directed staff to review the post-award and implementation phase for state administered grants to local governments and identify any changes warranted to streamline these processes so that grants may be more effectively utilized. State administered grant programs, including those that are federally funded, provide hundreds of millions of dollars to local governments in Tennessee each year. At their best, these programs are mutually beneficial, helping local governments achieve local, state, and national objectives that any one level of government may be unable to undertake on its own, whether, for example, building a park, expanding an intersection, buying a fire truck, or feeding school children. The post-award phase is the stage in a grants life cycle when the activities for which funding has been awarded or carried out. Both the grantor and grantee have responsibilities during the post-award phase. These responsibilities, in large part, involve complying with grant requirements, which vary across grant programs, and by funding source, with federal funding triggering federal requirements for both the state agency serving as the pass-through entity for funding and the local government grantee. Regardless of whether they are state or federal in origin, Grant requirements help ensure the use of taxpayer funds is accountable and transparent during the post-award phase. That is, they help ensure grantees did what they said they would do, how they said they would do it, and followed proper procedures for using taxpayer funds. But these requirements can also be a source of frustration for grantor and grantee alike when verifying that projects comply with grant requirements. Local governments, in particular, can often cite a litany of delays and costs resulting from efforts to comply with state and federal requirements during the post-award phase of various grant programs, some of which have led them to consider turning down funding. <coughs> to identify requirements and processes that create issues for grantees, commission staff interviewed local officials and staff, development districts, and consulting firms that help local governments with grant management and state grant management staff. These interviews highlighted some of the difficulties involved in finding solutions. For example, federal requirements, and particular requirements and processes for complying with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, were commonly cited as sources of delay and frustration, and there was general agreement that grants subject to federal requirements have more requirements and can be more frustrating to manage than grants subject only to state requirements. 
Many local officials and those who assist them with grant management said some frustrating requirements and processes, regardless of whether they are state or federal, appear to be made without input from or consideration for their practical effect on grantees. But some state agencies have established grant advisory boards to solicit guidance from grantees for making changes to their grant programs. For example, the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development has established an advisory board which meets regularly and includes local officials and those who assist them with grant management for its Community Development Block Grant Program. ECD staff said the board helps them identify and make specific improvements to grant processes to assist grantees. Individuals who sit on these boards said they find them useful and recommend more agencies use them. Staff for one agency have also expressed potential interest in creating a state level working group for agency agencies to share best practices with each other. Another practice that some agencies have adopted can help reduce the time it takes local governments with grants from multiple agencies to satisfy the requirements of Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act. Title VI prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin in any program or activity that receives federal funding. State law also requires that agencies comply with Title VI. Compliance requires grantees to take training annually, and some agencies require grantees to take agency-specific training, meaning those with grants from multiple agencies might have to take multiple trainings. But some agencies permit grantees to satisfy compliance with Title VI by allowing them to use training completed for other agencies. Another potential solution recommended by grantors, grantees, development districts, and consultants is the adoption of a single grant management system to be used by all state agencies. A GMS is a software system that allows for the end-to-end -end management of grant programs and projects. Proponents say these systems can be beneficial for the post-award phase because they can help grantor and grantee staff track a project's, project, track a project's progress while maintaining a record of communication between grantor and grantee. A single statewide GMS could have the added benefits of being a one-stop shop for grantees to view and manage all of their programs, regardless of agency, and could also allow them to search for grant opportunities across agencies. The Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration has procured a single GMS for use by other state agencies, though use of the system is not required. So far, one agency is using the system, and the Department of Finance and Administration is working with several other agencies that have expressed interest in using it. Each of these approaches offers a pathway to improve state processes for managing, managing the post-award and implementation phase of grants to local governments. While ensuring grant funds are used accountably and transparent, transparently is an indispensable component of grants management, so too is ensuring that grant processes support local government's ability to carry out projects effectively. They are essential if state and local governments are to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars used to fund grants. As the USACIR concluded in 1977, Grantors and grantees, quote, need to work together with reasonable awareness of and feeling for each other's capabilities and roles. For these reasons, the draft report makes two recommendations for specific changes to state processes. First, the state should require agencies to use a single statewide grant management system to promote a more uniform, user-friendly experience across agencies for grantees, with exceptions provided for agencies that can demonstrate the system won't support functions necessary for their grant programs. And second, state agencies should accept Title VI training provided by other agencies when verifying compliance with federal and state law, unless they can demonstrate other agencies' trainings are inadequate for their programs to eliminate the need for grantees to take multiple trainings when they have grants with multiple agencies. And the draft report makes two general recommendations to promote good stewardship of grant funds through the identification and adoption of best practices. First, state agencies should regularly convene grant advisory boards made up of representatives for local governments and the entities that assist them with carrying out grant projects, similar to the boards already established by ECD and other agencies, to solicit feedback for improving grant requirements and processes and to prioritize issues of importance to grantees, for example, when considering new programmatic agreements with federal partners. And second, the state could consider establishing an interagency working group for sharing lessons learned from agencies' efforts to improve grant requirements and processes to promote the adoption of best practices across grant programs. That concludes my presentation. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the members? Any questions? Uh, Senator Lumber? No. Oh, no, Senator Yarbrough. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for your report. So 
uh, FNA has a, and a, an existing GMS that can be used. Uh, I guess two questions. How many other departments actually have procured grant management systems that are in place and in effect? And do we have a sense of the duration of those, uh, of those contracts? And then I guess separately, does the F&A system that we have actually have the, the detail and customization that you would need to do to, to you know, you know, succeed in taking those, those grants on? Sure. Um, it's a great question. So it's sort of unclear at the moment how many exactly state agencies have their own grant management system. Um, it ranges, some have their own kind of homegrown systems and some have a full-blown grant management system, but we didn't collect data on exactly how many state agencies have uh, their own grant management system. And as for the contracts, that would be something that would, um, would be taken into account when rolling it out statewide is, you know, something to consider whether you let a uh, state agency let see their contract out or, um, yeah, I think that would be definitely taken under consideration. Um, I'm sorry, what was your second question again? I, uh, well, what I was trying to get a sense of is w which de departments or agencies are, have really robust programs and does the F&A, uh, you know, our single unit, you know, what would be our candidate for, I guess, for a, for a single grant system, does it have the capacities that those agencies would need? Sure. Uh, so in conversations we've had with STS uh, in FNA, they have said that the system should have uh, a good bit of customization and should be able to um, accommodate most of the state agencies. However, uh, they did say it's possible that it might not be able to cover all state agencies, um, which is partially why in the recommendation um, we had a caveat that said, with exceptions provided for agencies that can demonstrate the system won't support functions necessary for their grant programs. I did, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, can you tell me in the report, or if there's any area of the of the report? that addresses equalizing the playing field between the larger uh, organizations that are receiving the majority of the grants from the state versus those smaller organizations where a lot of the work is actually being done out of the pockets of the individuals that are running these smaller organizations. Uh, do you mean organizations as in state agencies or local governments? Uh, Nonprofits. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so our study specifically looked at um, local governments. We didn't look really too much into nonprofits and other non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now, as far as local governments, um, let's see, let me find the, uh, if you turn to page uh, 10, we do have figures that show uh, grant funding received for cities and counties uh, by population. Okay. Uh, if you look at first glance, you'll see that obviously counties and cities with higher populations uh, have higher total payments received, but when you qualify that for um, population, like we've done in figure two, uh, and in figure four, you can see there's not really a trend of whether or not the larger cities or counties get more funding. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quick follow-up. But, but some of these, some of these challenges that we were addressing in in the report, um, it, it doesn't just affect local government; it affects these nonprofit organizations also. So maybe there's uh, some of the solutions that we're we're considering implementing will have having to be able to address some of the things that we're that some of these other organizations are doing also, because I think I think most of the time in a lot of cases rather, you know these grants that are they are coming down into local government, but they're also being passed through in some cases, you know to some of these uh, nonprofit organizations and even um, with with the state themselves they're doing uh, direct business with these uh, nonprofit organizations also. So I'm just a little bit. Um, surprised that we didn't address some of that in there too. But I appreciate it, and I appreciate all your hard work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Belden, thank you for your work. And I'm going to direct this question to Director Lippert if, if that's acceptable. Uh, I agree with all the recommendations. I think all the local governments, counties, and cities 
would stand in agreement also, but there's three shoulds and a could. And my question is, how can we make that strongly recommends, possibly not going to the word must, but uh, those of us that are having to give money back because it took so long to fill out the paperwork, uh, I think I'd like a, a stronger recommendation. Well, certainly, uh, Chairman. Uh, th that's at the, the discretion of, of the commission. We're happy to change that to a strongly rec strongly recommend or whatever language the commission would, would like to use. We, we tend to come in a little soft on our recommendations because we don't want to overstate your emphasis, but we're, but if, if it's the, the will of the commission, we're happy to, to make those stronger. Thank you. If I may, uh, Mayor Brooks and Director, we w oh, this is the draft report, but we will be voting on the final report at a later date. That's correct. And at that time, we could always amend it as a body to change those words. I'd certainly enter be happy to entertain any motion like that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is outside the scope of this study, and so I, I guess this is just sort of a general question because I'm new here. Has there been discussion at all of, um, of assessing how um, specific departments are awarded grants, um, in particular TWRA? So do you mean how um, they In terms grant of funding? how grants within their own program are awarded and, and, and implemented uh, from the federal government? Sure. Uh, I would say that that's not something that we've really looked at with this study, but if you'd like us to, we can certainly look into that between now and the final report. I guess that was sort of a general question for, has that been done? Uh, Senator, I'm, I, I, I don't know a study that has looked at the, the grant award process from the federal government to the state government. Of course, that was outside of the scope of what we were right. asked to look at in, in this study, but we, uh, we, we're happy to, to check the literature and see if there are, are any such studies. Thanks. These are good recommendations, uh, but, but I also agree the, the shoulds and the coulds, maybe a little bit stronger language there. But I would be very interested in hearing from those same um, departments again once, once they receive this. And I would like to know, oh, okay, now you, you've heard what we would like. How are you going to remedy this so that the grant uh, process is condensed. Just mm -hmm. having it in front of you is one thing, but I'd, I'd like to hear what's what they plan to do. And yeah, we can definitely follow up with, with the state agencies uh, between now and the final report. And it, if, you don't, uh, if you don't mind, um, Mayor, I'll, this is probably a good time for me to mention I did uh, uh, give a copy of this draft to the city of Oak Ridge, which was the entity that asked me to make this, to make the request that <coughs> resulted in this report. And they were, they were, I'll, I'm going to, I've given it to Director Lippert to put in the minutes. Uh, it's just a one pager, but they were very optimistic and highly complimentary of your work. They thought, they thought you'd, you were on your way to fixing some problems here. I mean, I, I think one thing that I, I think we should potentially consider in the final report is, uh, I mean, we've got probably 20 departments and agencies that are administering, you know, in this three-year period, uh, you know, eight figures of, of grants. And so I, I think trying to understand whether there's any, whether there's appetite or resistance to this and understanding what it might be, because I think it could shape what we would actually want to recommend. Because, I, I mean, you could, for instance, you could see someone wanting there to be a common product where, you know, the, 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 the interface is effectively the same, but the contents res like reside with the department who's administering that particular grant as opposed to like sort of losing control of it. But I, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think trying to understand where the resistance points are and whether, because it might shape what the system that we would want to have would be. 
Uh, I mean, I think so. If we if if we could talk to a couple of the, you know, the the top five or six agencies that are looking into this and think whether they would be willing to, you know, participate in one of these in a unified system, or and if not, why not? We might actually get a little bit of clarity that might be helpful. Yes, Senator, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a question for the Senator. Do we do that and invite that input or say this is the best recommendation because we, this body, has the 50,000-foot view? And that recommendation, I think that's why uh, we have a couple of suggestions of, uh, pardon my paraphrasing, but putting that recommendation italicized and bolded uh, most strongly. Um, I don't know if we want to solicit input because there's always going to be people who ha are reluctant to any kind of change. I know some law firms that would still have Rolodexes if they could have. Uh, no, I mean, I think that the, 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 the report noted that this recommendation has been made before, right? I mean, in, I mean, I think one of the reasons that FNA did this is that the, you know, one of the governor's management fellows did, you know, yeah. did a, a, a report on this. But I think you, you haven't seen a lot of a buy-in on the, the common system. So, I, I mean, you, I guess I, you're more optimistic about our, like the, str the strength that our, that our recommendation might. I mean, I think we can recommend it strongly, should recommend it strongly, but we might actually get a, a better understanding of what kind of common system they would all use. Because we don't actually care as much about how common it is at the state level so much as we do at the user level. I mean, we don't want it to be, we don't want, ha want every county government to have to learn 17 different systems, but that doesn't mean that one single department needs to sort of have the controls over every grant necessarily. Others? Yes, you're recognized. We can't hear you, ma'am. No. Can I go ahead and help her? Let's try this one better. So with Senator Yarbrough's recommendation, um, I know you didn't name the department that was using the system, uh, but I'll confess, uh, we are uh, Department of Labor and Workforce Development. I do think it's helpful to talk to the agency along the lines of implementation. There are some nuances. You know, we were able to launch very seamlessly with one set of funding from Department of Labor, but with education, it was a little bit difficult. Um, I really think it could help with the implementation, and I know we have folks that would be happy to talk to you about the system. And I think th these are all good points. I do, do want to make sure the, com the, uh, the commissioners are aware that, you know, as part of our research process, the, the team has is, is interviewed and spoken with the departments extensively on what their requirements are what, what, and, and have talked to them about this type of approach and what might be some of the, some of the, the, the issues that would need to be worked around. And that's part of the reason we, we have things like unless their, their particular requirements don't work with a, a shared system. So th th none of this is going to come as a surprise to the, to the, to the departments. Uh, we're happy to uh, share the draft report with the depart departments between now and, and the next meeting when we bring it back to you as a, as a final report. And if they do have any, any new concerns or objections, we'll incorporate those into the report. And we could also, I mean, in the, in the future, if it's the will of the commission, set up a kind of a follow-up panel on, on progress since the report. This report being due um, early next year, this is January, Chris? We're gonna uh, say January. Um, the, the, we, we don't wanna insert a panel between now and, and January, but, but this is something we, could, we could, could do to follow up on, on progress on it in the future.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wasn't going to say anything, and I'm, I'm still a, kind of a rookie here, so I apologize. But a follow-up panel for me works, and I know it's mainly we're talking about grant administration, but I would be remiss if I didn't draw your attention to pages 11 through 13 and notice a singular outlier in grants awarded per capita in the state being Shelby and Memphis by a country mile. Uh, and when you look at Memphis and it's the poorest county in the state uh, on poverty rate and children's poverty, but it's the second largest GDP generator, it's kind of shocking when you see the amount of dollars that are actually flowing on a per capita basis back into it. So I hope that a grant administration system that is more facilitated will help at least pair up what Memphis produces and what Memphis returns. You, know, you got to make these investments in communities like that because we can't do it on our own. But again, I understand we're talking more about the administration, but when you see something so glaring of such an outlier and being a legislator from there, it was worth putting on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Well, there being none, no. then we, we will thank you for your report. We'll thank you for your report. And of course, this is the draft report. We, there's no vote required today. Uh, so we will move on now to tab four uh, to hear the draft report on public chapter 503, the childhood obesity draft report for review and comment by David Lewis. Mr. Lewis, there we are. Mr. Lewis is approaching. And I, you're recognized, sir, for a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, I'm David Lewis, Research Director, and I am presenting the draft report under tab four, incremental improvements to Tennessee's childhood obesity problem are possible for your review and comment. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Kevin Van Zant, the lead author and researcher for this report. Dr. Van Zant left Hasser to return to teaching in July. I'm going to be presenting among the summary and recommendations four draft recommendations. The first three are interspersed um, throughout the summary and recommendations. The last one is at the end of the summary and recommendations. And I will point out uh, when I'm about to read each of the four draft recommendations. Tennessee's childhood obesity rate has been trending higher for more than two decades and every major report on childhood obesity shows that Tennessee is worse than the national average. High childhood obesity rates are associated with negative health outcomes for children, as well as with higher obesity rates and negative health outcomes for adults. The rates of childhood and adult obesity in Tennessee are consistently higher than in most other states, with roughly a fifth of Tennessee's children obese and a third of Tennessee's adults obese. Childhood obesity is estimated to cost both Tennessee and the United States a substantial amount in related health care and other costs, although exact dollar figures cannot be determined. The causes of childhood obesity are many and complex. The Mayo Clinic lists six overlapping factors that increase a child's risk of becoming overweight. These six are diet, lack of exercise, family factors, psychological factors, socioeconomic factors, and certain medications. In the United States, the recognition of the upward trend in childhood obesity rates and its many root causes has led to a wide array of responses from federal, state, and local governments. But as this report documents, these efforts to both understand and confront the problem have not been enough to halt and reverse the overall increasing trend of childhood obesity. Because of the Tennessee General Assembly's concerns about childhood obesity, Public Chapter 503, Acts of 2021, requires the Commission to perform a comprehensive evaluation on the socioeconomic impact childhood obesity has in Tennessee and its short and long-term effects. This is not unique to Tennessee. Childhood obesity has been an ongoing academic epidemic in Tennessee, the U.S., and the world for over two decades. In 1997, the World Health Organization, or WHO, formally recognized obesity as a global epidemic and in 2021 estimated that the worldwide prevalence of obesity had nearly tripled since 1975. 
Um, among children and adolescents aged 15 through 19, excuse me, 5 through 19, the WHO found the share who were obese or overweight increased from just 4% in 1975 to more than 18% in 2016 worldwide. Both WHO and the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, determine whether someone is overweight or obese based on their body mass index, or BMI. Both the WHO and the CDC define obesity as a BMI at or above the 95th percentile, and overweight is defined as being at or above the 85th percentile up to the 95th percentile. P table one on page four of the executive summary and recommendations shows statistics for both children and adults, and you can see um, see how uh, things vary across obesity and overweight. One thing that uh, the literature and stakeholders noted when we uh, interviewed them is that childhood obesity rates vary across various demographics, including race, ethnicities, and family incomes. For one example, the National Survey of Children's Health data from 2019 and 2020 shows the obesity rate for Tennessee children 10 through 17 was 30.4% for Hispanics, 25.2% for African Americans, and 17.3% for white children. For the same years, that this data showed similar disparities nationally. Regarding income levels in Tennessee, the same data reports the obesity percentage for children 10 through 17 whose family income was at four different tiers. The lowest tier was for those whose family income was below the federal poverty line, and 29.9% of those children were obese, whereas at the highest tier relative to household income, 400% or more of the federal poverty line, only 9.7% were obese. So for the lowest income bracket, roughly 30%, and for the highest income bracket, roughly 10%. But class alone is not determinative of childhood obesity rates in the state. For instance, overall poverty rates for children under 18 in Tennessee fell from 25.7% in 2010 to 19.7% in 2019. Inflation-adjusted household income increased, increased across all racial groups in the same period but childhood obesity rates have still trended higher in that period. Childhood obesity is associated with negative health outcomes for children and adults, and these include uh, high blood pressure, developing high blood pressure, developing high cholesterol, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and fatty liver disease. The report goes into uh, more details on these as well as additional health outcome issues. Negative, negative psychological consequences of childhood obesity are also well established. Weight stigma and bullying can contribute to behaviors such as binge eating, social isolation, avoidance of healthcare services, decreased physical activity, and increased weight gain over time. Overall, obese children and adults are five times more likely to be obese in adulthood than children and adolescents who were not obese and an individual is three times more likely to be obese as an adult if they enter kindergarten as an obese child. However, childhood obesity developing into adult obesity is still not the primary cause of adult obesity at the national level. 80% of obese adults at least age 30 were not obese in adolescence, and obesity in adulthood has many of the same health and emotional consequences as childhood obesity. Tennessee state government has made efforts to halt the increase in childhood obesity, but more could be done. Um, I'm just going to hit some high-level things the state has been doing, and then I'll go into some specific details. From better nutrition and more strenuous physical activity and physical education requirements in Tennessee schools to gold cer sneaker certifications for Tennessee daycares to better access to green spaces and parks, state initiatives have attempted to make Tennessee children healthier and halt the increase in childhood obesity. Some state initiatives are Tennessee's implementation of federal nutrition programs, such as the various school meal programs, and the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children, known as WIC. Many state efforts to make children and youth healthier have focused on public schools and daycares, the common locations where many children spend approximately a third of their days. The first state program I want to focus on is co coordinated school health. 
In the late 1980s, the CDC developed the Coordinated School Health, or CSH, model, and it was intended to build on the growing and increasingly complex understanding of the intertwined relationship between children's education and health, as well as to encourage systemic coordination to eliminate gaps and overlaps and the best uses of personnel, time, and resources. With the passage of the Coordinated School Health Improvement Act in 2000, Tennessee became the first state in the United States to pass legislation mandating this model. From the beginning, there was a focus on uh, reducing childhood obesity. As envisioned by the CDC, a CSH coordinator ensures a systematic approach is implemented to create and sustain healthy school environments so students can receive the support needed to make healthy choices. In addition to collecting and sharing BMI data with the Tennessee Department of Health, the CSH is also statutorily, re statutorily required to submit the Coordinated School Health Annual Report and the Health Services Annual Report to the Governor and General Assembly and a Physical Education and Activity Report to the General Assembly. Funding for CSH, which has not been increased since 2007, was not calculated as part of the K-12 funding formula used through this current year, 22-23, the Basic Education Program, BEP. However, recognizing the importance of CSH and its funding, the CSH is included in the base funding of the Tennessee Investment in Student Achievement, or TISA, which the state will begin to use to calculate K-12 funding in school year 23-24. However, currently available information about TISA does not show the amount of state funds each district will receive for CSH. And this leads me to the first draft recommendation I want to bring to your attention. Given that research supports the importance of coordinated collaborative efforts in addressing childhood obesity, the General Assembly should ensure each district receives at least the same amount of state funds for CSH under TISA than it did before. Next, I'm going to talk briefly about physical activity generally and physical activity in schools. Regular physical activity promotes health and fitness. Physically active children and youth have lower body fat, stronger bones and muscles, and improved cognition, and also reduce symptoms of depression. Accordingly, the United States Department of Health and Human Services currently recommends that children and adolescents age 6 through 17 engage uh, all seven days of the week in 60 minutes or more of moderate to vi vigorous physical activity. On average, 42% of Tennessee's children's daily physical activity occurs in school settings, and the state of Tennessee has taken numerous steps and actions to increase physical activity in public schools over the years, including by strengthening laws to require more time spent on physical education and physical activity. When you look at Tennessee compared to the national level of children's physical activity, um, it's pretty close. We're, we're not an outlier there. We look like the national average. School nutrition is another factor influencing childhood obesity. Children can consume up to two meals and a snack in a given day at school, which can amount to as much as 58% of their total daily caloric intake. In Tennessee, all public schools participate in the Federal National School Lunch Program which determines the nutritional standards for food served and available in all participating schools. And since 1990, the United States Department of Agriculture has taken numerous steps to tr strengthen the nutritional standards of all meals served in schools that are part of the um, funded programs. And they have established caloric limits for different age groups, decreased sodium levels and fat content, and increased the required offerings of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. And what we found when we dug into this is, for example, uh, what I think of as a Pop-Tart uh, that I might get at the grocery store. If I got a Pop-Tart at school, it's actually not the same. It has been modified. And although it is processed food, it's been modified to have lower sugar, lower fat, et cetera. So even though it looks like a Pop-Tart, it's not what you and I think of as a Pop-Tart. I want to mention uh, something the state is supportive of uh, that we found as we uh, read the literature and interviewed stakeholders. Time and time again, the issue of breastfeeding came to the fore. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends breastfeeding for all infants 
and studies have shown that breastfeeding is associated with a reduced risk of children becoming overweight or obese. Research also shows that the longer an infant breastfeeds, the less likely he or she is to become overweight. Recognizing the importance of breastfeeding and getting children a good start with a healthy life, the state has taken many steps to support mothers, families, and employers. Uh, this includes passing several laws to protect breastfeeding mothers over the last several decades. And additionally, the Department of Health maintains a comprehensive website with tons of resources about breastfeeding support for those families that choose that approach to nutrition. Next, I want to talk about WIC, which I mentioned briefly a moment ago. And studies have found evidence of declining rates of obesity for children participating in WIC. WIC is a federally funded program designed to provide supplemental food assistance and nutrition education to low-income pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women, infants, and children until age five. WIC also provides breastfeeding support and referrals to health care and community-based services. The declining rates of obesity for children served by WIC goes against the national trends. The nationwide trend for all preschoolers showed obesity increasing and puts preschool children participating in WIC on par with the national average, which includes children at all income levels. In 2019 in Tennessee, the coverage rate of participating people divided by eligible people served by WIC was 43.6%. Tennessee's coverage rate was below the national average of 57.4% and below that of some of our neighboring states. If Tennessee raised its coverage rate to the 2019 national average of 57.4%, this would add almost 35,000 more participants to the program. And although there's many more than 35,000 children and families who have issues with weight and obesity in Tennessee, uh, this is a positive thing and we want to encourage it. So the next draft recommendation is, although no data are available showing how effective its current efforts to increase participation are, the Tennessee Department of Health should continue trying to increase participation in Tennessee's special supplemental program, excuse me, supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children, WIC. The next thing I'd like to mention very briefly, is in 2021, Public Chapter 373 created the Chronic Weight Management Task Force to study the health implications of chronic weight management and type 2 diabetes in our state. The task force has held four public hearings with public health experts and will report its findings and recommendations to the General Assembly by January 15th, 2023. Our report is due at the end of January 2023. And the next draft recommendation is, even though the focus was not limited to childhood obesity, the state should review and consider the recommendations of the Chronic Weight Management Task Force, given their medical expertise and focus on improving treatment options for obesity. And as I lead into the last recommendation, I want to note that both the CDC and the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies recommend multi-level strategies to develop environments and policies that support healthy eating and physical activity across a range of settings, including schools, web, work sites, communities, and healthcare. And uh, I'm going to present the draft recommendation, and um, it is longer than what you're familiar with at TASR, so please, uh, please be patient with me. Given the consensus on the importance of multi-level strategies, the commission recommends a data-driven and community-level approach to further address childhood obesity in the state. The first step would be to collect the appropriate community-level data, most of which is not yet available. The Tennessee Livability Collaborative, a working group of approximately 20 state agencies with a mission of improving the prosperity, quality of life, and health of Tennesseans is already working on collecting a set of 120 community indicators, many of which, such as access to parks and recreation and food insecurity, are relevant to childhood obesity. The collaborative can add more indicators relevant to childhood obesity. Agencies participating in the collaborative already work together to, so to coordinate state efforts to solve difficult problems. The collaborative is supported by Tennessee Department of Health staff and the Department of Health is willing to further coordinate state efforts to target childhood obesity through the collaborative. The second step would be to analyze and evaluate the data 
including examining how different demographics are affected by childhood obesity. The Office of Evidence and Impact in the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration, which promotes and facilitates data sharing among departments to gain deeper insights about program outcomes, identify gaps in state services, and inform intelligent policy design would be particularly helpful with this kind of analysis. The Office of Evidence and Impact is willing to support the Tennessee Department of Health and the Livability Collaborative. The third step is for the state to use insights from the data to create pilot programs in communities with high rates of childhood obesity to test the effectiveness of these programs. If a local community does then slow or even halt the growth in its rate of childhood obesity, that local data would allow the state to evaluate more precisely which efforts are leading to the positive change and state officials could then consider taking the initiative statewide. This data-driven community approach would be a new direction for the state on this issue and the Livability Collaborative and the Office of Evidence and Impact are willing to work closely with other state agencies and departments to find out what is working to improve childhood obesity at the community level. However, even if successful, it is likely that halting and reversing the childhood obesity trend at the state level will take time and require efforts across multiple administrations. And with that, I look forward to answering your questions and hearing your comments. And I believe that the chairman is also willing to recognize a guest. Is that yes. true? Um, yes, we're, we're, we have a guest and delighted to have Dr. John Vick with the Tennessee Department of Health here today, too, uh, who might, if we have some questions about the role of the health, my health department, would certainly be uh, cap qualified to answer those questions. And at this time, I will. Uh, uh, recognize Senator Lundberg. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question for you. Uh, going to the section on school lunches, uh, you talk about 58% or, or students receive 58% of their caloric intake during school. Um, I'm going to give you three or four questions at once, so my apologies, sure. and you can take them in whatever order. Okay. It, and it may just be me, but is that high? Is that low? Is that what is expected? At first glance to me, that seems high, but from 7.30 until 3.30, you're spending a good part of your day there. And then in that same section, it's only a really a paragraph long, you talk about the secondary sales where schools have vending machines and things like that. Are you advocating, uh, A, those sh we should remove those, they should be considered taken out? Um, is this a school lunch issue? Um, so, sorry, there are three or sure. four questions in there. Sure. I'll just shoot it to you. I believe um, that the it's up to 58%. It's, uh, that would be like the ceiling for average on the amount of food consumed there. Um, but that, that, that assumes that you're um, having, you know, all those meals and a healthy snack. Not ever. Not all child. Not all children have breakfast. Not all children have lunch. Some children bring things. Uh, so I can dig into it more if you'd like. But and it, it may be on the high end. But that was like up to that amount. In terms of the healthy, uh, in terms of vending machines and all, that is already uh, the General Assembly's already made some decisions about how much. Uh, to cover there, so I would not, I would not suggest doing anything to change that. There are already federal requirements that um, the state states have to comply with and districts have to comply with. So no, I would not be recommending any particular action on that, other than what an individual school district and community might decide for itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually, I always say that this legislature here is a food desert. Um, so um, that's kind of my question. I, I realize that um, the Tennessee, I, I realize that really there's a lot of information that needs to be gathered here. It's kind of the ultimate recommendation, which I appreciate. Um, so um, the Tennessee Liver Livability Collaborative might already be in the process, although it's not mentioned of uh, looking into this, but I think a big problem is accessibility. Um, we do have a lot of food deserts, and I just want to make sure that when this, you know, when they're looking into these things, that that's not ignored. 
Um, absolutely. That's actually um, food insecurity is one of the things in the in the recommendation where we're talking about the livability collaborative. That's one of the one of the measures they already are working on collecting. So. Thank you. And yeah, I'm not just talking about food insecurity. I'm talking about the fact that a lot of times people can get food, but it's right. not healthy food. Right. Um, yes, that certainly would be something that they would. And, and actually, Dr. Vick is here if he wanted to add anything. But certainly they, they are very concerned about uh, places where there is no access to healthy food. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, the research on that is complicated in that having access to healthy food does not necessarily lead to healthy eating and healthy outcomes. Um, so that is, so wh what you'd want to figure out is what's the next, what's the next thing that would make that work. Um, and, and it's really hard to tease this out at the state level because, um, stakeholders and state departments feel like the childhood obesity rate would be even worse than it is if they weren't doing all the things they are. But I have not, you know, I have not been able to tease out, you know, the childhood obesity rate would be this if it wasn't for X, Y, and Z program. So that was one reason for this community approach. You can figure out exactly what's going on and what levers might be working together to get you the the most effect, the most positive effect you can, where at the state level, it's really hard to untangle everything. Yeah, it's a, it's a super comp complicated ecosystem that has, um, you know, taken many years to develop, and I'm sure that that's hard to tease out. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. I had a question about uh, a follow-up on WIC. Um, you know that there are declining rates of obesity for children that are participating in WIC, and then you um, note that we are below the national average. Did you have in this study any insight to what are the barriers to participation in Tennessee? Do we do things differently? I know kind of as a follow-up to your exchange there, you do make better choices under WIC because you're limited on you know, what, what you're able to get, and that teaches the healthy options. Are the other states doing something different? Is it other food programs that are just easier to deal with, and why bother with WIC if I can go out and get anything I want? You know, wh what did you find there? Um, I hate to keep using the word complicated, but um, it's complicated, and it's especially complicated because of, of the COVID pandemic. The, the USDA put a waiver in for across the board uh, for all its nutrition programs, various waivers. And one of the waivers was that for WIC, you no longer had to come in for your initial intake visit because uh, it was determined for public health that wasn't a good idea, so it was able to be done remotely. Uh, so certainly, that would be something that uh, folks had talked about even before the pandemic. Maybe it doesn't have to be in person. So it's really hard to tease out, you know, how much effect that may or may not have had because at the same time they were doing that, it was during the pandemic. And um, they're, they're constantly trying to figure out ways to uh, improve things. Um, the director we spoke with said when she talks to her peers in other states, uh, they're always comparing notes. To, well, how did you do that? And how were you? And like, and, it's, and it is really hard to pin down exactly what is responsible for the difference in states. Every state is, you know, trying at various levels to increase participation, and it's really hard to, um, to figure that out. And again, this would, this would help. It's, it's doing good things. It might help some additional people, but that would not take care of the larger problem for the state. It would help people eligible for that program. Sort of building off uh, this question because, I mean, there are so many different factors going in and so many different things that you could measure. If you're thinking about one of, one of the recommendations involves pilot programs, if you've got pilot programs that, are, that have different approaches, how do you find the, like, what are the common measures that 
we should be using across those efforts, um, you know, sort of to, sure. so that we can really assess or do our best at, at assessing impact and return? That's a, that's a great question. And if he will allow me to call him up, uh, is that something you want me to? I'll, I'll take a shot at it, and then you can ask for further. Um, well, well, first of all, you'd um, first of all you'd you'd want to get all the you, you want to get all the departments on the same page, and and decide collectively what we need to understand. And I, I spoke with the collaborative on a web uh, meeting last week, and told them about this idea, um, and they are in discussion about it, and uh, I believe that at their next meeting they're going to continue to discuss it. So that would be something that, that I can't do. That would be something the state departments and agencies working with the Office of Evidence and Impact and the Livability Collaborative would need to, to really, really hone in on, agree on, and then the Office of Evidence and Impact have, you know, they've got the data gurus who can and do that sort of thing. So that would be, that would be what would need to be done. It would need to be collectively decided what, what's the right take there, uh, in, in my opinion. Are there other questions? Thank you, Chairman. I think the thing that stuck out the most to me in your report was on page three. It said, w, the WHO found the share who were obese or overweight increased from 4% in 1975 to more than 18% in 2016. Uh, in your recommendations, though, you don't reference as a recommendation to look at the, s the changes in societal norms and the family unit and what was different about kids and society in of itself in order to return to a 4% obesity rate, which we had in 1975. And now, according to the data, it looks as if 36.9% uh, uh, according to the census data on 15, 36.9% of our children 10 to 17 are ov overweight or obese. So from 4% in 1975 to, to 36%. Did, sure. did you take into consideration looking and seeing what, what has changed? Maybe the, uh, of, the old can be made new again, I suppose. Um, there are uh, any number of articles um, attempting to do uh, what, what you're asking about. And, and those uh, first numbers you mentioned, I believe, that was uh, worldwide and then the so... Um, we, of course, tried to look at that, but it is a worldwide phenomenon. So it's something going on, not just in Tennessee, not just in the United States. It's something going on across the world. And um, certainly we could, we could try to synthesize um, what all the various academic research shows as various reasons for that. But um, it's, it's definitely not something unique to Tennessee. It is something that is going on worldwide, nationwide. Um, and I believe some of those things would, um, we talked about access to, to food. Um, one thing that struck me when I was doing this research is that in like the 90s, people were looking at the United States in Great Britain, in other parts of the world, people were going, what is the deal? What is their deal with obesity? What is, there's, we have almost no obesity. What is wrong with them? And then they started having the same things happening. And they're like going from what's their deal over there to what's our deal? And um, nobody has figured it out exactly, but there's clearly, you know, there's clearly things going on with uh, supply chains, to use a term that's recently caused us um, some anxiety, 
um, people have access to food, not always healthy food, but we do have access to food, generally speaking. The only, part, the only parts of the world where they hadn't seen these increases were sub-Saharan Africa and certain parts of South Asia. So everywhere else in the world is experiencing it. So you're, you're absolutely correct to be asking that question. There are clearly are things going on. Um, I would have to do more research to find out what some of them are. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chairman. And five, electric vehicles and other issues affecting road and highway funding. We have the draft report for our review and comment today, and we're delighted that Bob Morio, our research manager, will make the presentation. Mr. Morio, you're recognized, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Commission members. My name is Bob Morio. Uh, today I'm presenting the draft of our report on electric vehicles and other issues affecting road funding in Tennessee for your review and discussion. This report was prepared in response to members' concerns about the possible effects increased adoption of EVs might have on state and local road funding, their effect on electricity consumption and TVA payments in lieu of taxes, and issues related to expanding the state's EV charging infrastructure. First, I'll share with you a uh, summary of the report's findings, and that will lead to the report's three recommendations. Tennessee Department of Transportation and local governments rely, across the state rely on revenue from several sources to build and maintain the state's network of roughly 96,000 miles of public roads and 20,000 bridges. More than a third of all that revenue, 34% to be specific in 2019, spent on roads in the state comes from the federal government but only 20% of the road mileage is eligible for that federal aid, leaving the fiscal responsibility for most road construction and maintenance up to local governments and the state. City and county revenue sources contributed about 12% of Tennessee's overall road funding, primarily from local general funds. Sometimes local governments issue bonds to finance road projects, and that's something that the state has avoided doing for many, many years. The state's revenue sources account for approximately 54% of the overall road funding in Tennessee. State revenue for roads comes from several sources, including vehicle registration fees, nearly all of which is kept for the state highway fund. In the two most recent fiscal years, transfers were made from the state's general fund surplus. But the majority of the state's own source revenue comes from the state's fuel taxes, portions of which are shared with county and city governments providing 55% of revenue for local roads statewide. Figure three on page 15 of the report shows how the state's gas tax is shared. And then behind that on figure four uh, shows the split between state and local revenue as used by local governments uh, for their roads. And on the first one, uh, it's approximately 60% of revenue from the state's tax on gasoline goes to the state highway fund. 25% is shared with the counties and 13% with municipalities. And I'll point out that revenue from the tax on diesel fuel is distributed a little differently. Um, mostly this report focuses um, on gasoline uh, since we're talking about electric vehicles and the vehicles that people drive. Of course, fully electric vehicles don't need gasoline, therefore their owners do not pay fuel taxes. The IMPROVE Act of 2017 introduced an additional EV registration fee to ensure EV drivers would contribute something in lieu of fuel taxes. This $100 annual fee is usually less than what the driver of a new gas-powered car might pay in fuel taxes over the course of a year. And unlike gas tax, the revenue from these additional registration fees is not shared with local governments. No revenue can be collected from owners of EVs coming from out of state as well, uh, whereas out of state drivers of gas-powered vehicles contribute fuel tax revenue when they fill up in Tennessee. Tennessee's EV registration fee does not apply to plug-in hybrid electric vehicles either, which use some but far less gasoline than their non-electric counterparts. In Tennessee, less than 0.2% of light-duty vehicles registered in 2020 were electric, either fully electric or plug-in hybrid. That number is growing quickly. 
And we point out that automakers are investing heavily in EV and battery manufacturing facilities across Tennessee. From June 2020 to June 2022, the number of EVs registered in Tennessee more than doubled, increasing from about 9,000 to more than 20,000. Figure six on page 21 in the report shows our projected growth of EVs in Tennessee through 2030, at which point they would make up approximately 3% of all vehicles. Looking further out in 2040, EVs are projected to make up as much as 10% of vehicles registered in Tennessee, which would mean an estimated 600,000 electric vehicles, that's among 6 million total vehicles. So electric vehicles will affect road funding as their numbers increase, but its increases in fuel efficiency for gas-powered vehicles and in inflation of road construction costs that will have far greater effects on the state's road funding. If EVs made up 10% of vehicles in Tennessee in 2040, that could have the effect of reducing state gas tax revenue by an estimated $68 million. And some of that would be offset by the additional EV registration fees, but it's important to remember that that revenue would not be shared with local governments. Increases in fuel economy over the same period are projected to reduce gas tax revenue by much more. It goes to stand that if 10% of vehicles in 2040 are electric, 90% of vehicles are still going to be powered by gasoline. And U.S. average fuel economy is projected to improve from 23 miles per gallon in 2020 to 30 miles per gallon in 2040. Doing the math, that means a person driving 15,000 miles a year in Tennessee at 30 miles per gallon would pay $41 or 23% less in gas tax than they would when they were getting 23 miles per gallon. This increased average fuel economy in Tennessee has the potential to reduce gas tax revenue by about $163 million in 2040. With both of those said, uh, inflation is by far the most significant factor to affect future road funding. You turn to page 33, figure 14, shows how highway construction costs have risen faster even than overall prices in recent years. Over the past decade, highway costs have increased at an average annual rate of 3.6% compared to, it was 2.1% for uh, consumer prices um, overall across the decade. If highway costs continue to increase at that rate, they would mean an 89% increase from 2022 to 2040. And if that, happen, if that were to happen, it would reduce the purchasing power of the state's gas tax revenue by $399 million in 2040. We have figure one on page 33 or on page four um, that illustrates the combined effects of these three factors on projected gas tax revenue. There's a dashed green line at the top represents staff's projection of gas tax revenue. If there were no improvements to average fuel economy, no additional EVs, just increasing slowly as the state's driving population increases. Below that, the light orange bar shows the potential gas tax revenue lost to EVs that's $68 million in 2040. The light red bar below that shows potential revenue lost to increasing average fuel economy, the $163 million I mentioned. And then finally, the blue bar takes the projected revenue left after accounting for more EVs and better fuel economy and adjusts it for construction cost inflation at 3.6%. After describing Tennessee's system of roads, how we currently pay for them, and the effects at EVs, fuel efficiency and inflation will have on future revenue, the last section of the draft report describes some of the approaches other states are taking to maintain or enhance their road funding. Of the 30 states with EV fees, at least nine share some of that revenue with their local governments. A few use some of the money to help expand EV charging as well. 14 of those states apply the same or a reduced fee to plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. The report finds that Tennessee generates less revenue for roads from registration fees than most states, and the report points to a number of states that charge higher fees to register heavier passenger vehicles. But again, in Tennessee, revenue from registration fees is not shared with local governments. At least 22 states index their gas tax rate to inflation, average fuel economy, or both. 
In fact, indexing Tennessee's fuel taxes to inflation and population growth was considered in 2017 when the IMPROVE Act was enacted. However, having an annual rate adjustment in statute could result in automatic tax increases in future years when the General Assembly might otherwise choose to exercise its discretion to maintain existing rates. This happened this summer in Kentucky, where the governor chose to step in and prevent an automatic two cent increase from taking effect uh, when gas prices were soaring. As fuel taxes have become an increasingly less reliable source of revenue for roads nationwide, one alternative getting a lot of attention is to tax all vehicles on a per mile basis regardless of whether the vehicle is electric or gas powered. There are still many questions about the best way to implement such a per mile tax system and there's a lot of discussion in particular about privacy concerns. The report describes how several states are testing pilot programs which are being funded in part by the federal government. So in conclusion, while the growing adoption of EVs might not become a major issue for road funding in Tennessee for decades, it, along with changes in fuel economy, increasing inflation, and decisions about the distribution of various fees, points to a need for future modifications to Tennessee's road funding system. In recognizing these various factors mentioned, the draft report makes the following three recommendations. Number one, is that because the practical effect of the state's EV registration fee is to serve as a substitute for the gas tax by collecting revenue for road funding from vehicle owners who don't purchase gasoline and don't contribute through the gas tax, the state should consider sharing EV registration fees with local governments in the same proportion as the gas tax. And the state could also consider applying a reduced EV registration fee to plug-in hybrid vehicles and share that revenue with local governments in the same proportion as the gas tax. Number two, says that given the effects of inflation on the purchasing power of gas tax revenue, to assist lawmakers in evaluating whether to adjust the state's fuel tax rates, the Department of Revenue or another entity such as the State Funding Board should inform the General Assembly of the effects of inflation on the purchasing power of the state's fuel taxes at least once every two years. Number three, as the state confronts these trade-offs associated with any potential alternatives to its current fuel tax-based road funding framework, it should balance the ability to raise adequate revenue with equity for all drivers, regardless of whether their vehicles are powered by gas, electricity, or some other method. It should ensure that revenue from any adopted alternatives is shared with local governments in an equivalent manner to the current sharing of fuel taxes, and should ensure that any alternatives intended to offset lost revenues are designed to do so without discouraging customers from purchasing electric vehicles. The final draft of this report will be presented for your approval at our December meeting. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for uh, a, a very interesting uh, and provocative report. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions, and we're going to take those now. I am going to turn the uh, gavel over to the vice chairman because I have to leave the meeting for a little while to attend another uh, meeting. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Vice Chairman Brooks uh, and and just ask away now. Just ask all kinds of questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Are there questions for the draft report? Okay. Representative Williams, Chairman Williams. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brooks. The uh, vice chairman, I suppose. Uh, thank you for the report. I did. I was looking. Of, I had to step out, uh, like Senator Yeager did for a minute ago. What does the average consumer in Tennessee contribute? That is a um, a gas vehicle, or, or what does that average Tennessee contribute towards the gas tax? Did you calculate that at all? Because I know the legislature when we did the EV fee. Right. There was a formulary, I think, that Revenue or TDOT or somebody did that helped us determine what that fee was for an electric vehicle that was, I think it was to offset in part what the average consumer was. Yeah, and it really depends on what sort of fuel economy you'd choose to use as that, as that replacement. If you use the, the average fuel economy for all light-duty vehicles in Tennessee, uh, it's where you're going to be taking into consideration a lot of a lot of trucks, a lot of large SUVs, and things like that. So I believe overall the average fuel economy is like 22 miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. So you take that out, um, and, is it, the and average driver 12,000 miles. 
actually, I mean, it gets it's closer to fifteen thousand when you when you go by driver. Um, the average miles driven per vehicle is lower. Um, but we kind of figured drivers drive one vehicle at a time, so um, that was some of the numbers we were using. If you look at like page three, we have a calculation taking that fifteen thousand miles, and we used about it's twenty nine point nine there, but basically thirty miles per gallon is a typical new car that somebody would be purchased now. Mm -hmm. So you're saying instead of instead of buying an electric vehicle, if, if I didn't have electric vehicles, I were to buy a new Nissan Altima, I might be getting around 30 miles per gallon. So that person would pay about $136 a year in state fuel in the state gas tax. If you you know if you're driving a less efficient vehicle, you're paying more in fuel taxes. So someone getting you know 20 miles per gallon is going to be paying considerably more. If you're comparing it to, you know, a 50 mile per gallon, um, you know, Honda Civic or something smaller, um, th those people might be paying, you know, 80 or 90 dollars. So, it, it, coming up with what is the best way to set that figure, um, we didn't really make any sort of suggestions in that direction, mm -hmm. but that just sort of points out what we used at least to give that as an example. There's always just going to, you know, there's going to be a range. Do, do most, most other states do have a, a, a different fee for EV versus hybrid that has that, they, ha, they have both Tennessee's, I think, unique in that it only has one singularly. It was, so. I think we had 30, 30 states that have an EV fee of any kind, and then there's 14 that apply them to plug-in hybrids as well. Okay. Um, it's usually half or something less than than the full thing because they're, they're buying some gasoline. Um, there are, um, and so there are a couple that um, that even apply it to like tradition hybrids that you don't plug in, the kind of the older generation of hybrids, um, because those can get you know 50, 60 miles per gallon. So there's a few states that have fees to try to compensate for that. Um, I do say Tennessee's fees are $100 is kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, there's some that are considerably higher, some that are a bit lower, so we're kind of in the ballpark right now, but that can change over time. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Mayor Bickers. Thank you. Um, let me begin by um, suggesting I'm skeptical that of uh, the projected rate of adoption, I think is probably low. You note since 20, June 2020 to June 2022, it more than doubled at 123%. That was during a time when there were limited, was limited availability because there weren't that many being made. There were supply chain issues. Um, my uh, friends in the car business tell me that the demand is extraordinary now. Uh, for example, go try to buy a Ford F-150 electric pickup truck. Don't think you can even buy one. They're being sold before they hit the lot or very shortly after. And so it looks like what you what you all have done, and I appreciate this, is made a projection based upon the past. But if that if the project if the adoption rate increases right because you got more available more options to buy you overcome consumer resistance to range because we're building all these charging stations then would not the financial impact on state and local government accrue more quickly and at a greater amount than you're suggesting in this report and if so should we not reflect in our report that we may be underestimating the potential impact down the road? It could. I mean, the, pro the projections that we have in here are sort of a combination of the limited amount of historical trends and what a variety of different you know, other groups have projected. Um, I, I've kind of echoed some of your feelings that, that they've seemed, some of those have seemed conservative. Um, and a great deal of it does have to do with the timing of when do things really, you know, when do things roll out? Do, do these, is there more charging? And I think something I'm going to talk about with, with Cliff and with Matt, you know, it, for the final is, is presenting some of these figures as a range 
and sort of apply a couple of different rates to it and sort of say, you know, if, if things kind of can trend, kind of trend as most people, as the consensus is, this is kind of the ballpark of where it's going to be. Um, if, if it takes off faster, sort of give a number for that. Um, but either way, um, it's, the inflation is still, is, the bottom line is that the, the growing cost of building and maintaining the roads um, outpaces um, the other factors. I, I, and I may have missed it. I did not see in part of your report a discussion of the new legislation out of Congress, which I understand that we're looking at investing billions in new charging stations to alleviate consumer concerns over range limitations. Again, if we're investing that much money into these charging stations all across the country, you know, I, I would just wonder whether, I know that is new and that's recent, I wonder whether we should include at least a mention of that in report for the benefit of the legislature so they, could, they can at least consider the impact of the new federal legislation. Yeah, we do on page 24 where we talk about, 23 and 24, we talk about um, expanding the charging infrastructure in Tennessee. Um, on 24 there, um, below that map, um, it's talking about um, $88 million in the uh, uh, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, Program. Um, okay. Which, so I think, you know, what between now and the final in December, any new developments, anything, whatever's the most current, we can certainly um, make sure we have the most up-to-date information possible. As, as I understand it, and I don't, I'll be up front, I was interested in buying an EV and simply couldn't find one. Uh, that's particularly those new Ford pickups. I thought that thing looks cool. But anyway, the um, when someone goes and they drive down the interstate in Tennessee and they pull in at the charging station that their car tells them is there, are they paying any tax, any fee that would be the equivalent of the gas tax to hit, that could be targeted to the same uses as our gas tax? Not yet, and taxing the electricity is until very recently been something that nobody had really put into play. It's, it's been viewed as a possibility, but um, really hadn't, because it takes a lot of complications of how do you pay, um, you know, you have somebody like TVA, you have a, your local power company, the, the number of pieces involved kind of makes it a complicated way to, way to do things. But we've got, this hasn't been in, this wasn't in the report, but it was um, a couple of um, states that uh, passed legislation th this year. It's Iowa, Kentucky, Oklahoma, or tax commercial charging stations at three cents per kilowatt hour, roughly. Um, so that's an attempt to get um, get some of that. Uh, the two things I, I noticed about that is that it, this wouldn't capture any revenue from charging at home. So when you're plugged in at your house, you're not paying that. It's only commercial stations. So if it's if you're already paying someone to charge the vehicle, they can tax. It's I think it's easier to tack on a a tax to that. Um, but those are sort of two of the two of the limitations of trying to do things that way. But it is something that's starting to roll out, and I'd, I'll be adding some information about at least those three states in the, in the final report. As I understand it, you either pay through a credit card or most people just have an app on their phone and they, they pay. And so if there was a fee in Tennessee that we required them to pay, that is direct, that would be the, an equivalent of the gas tax. It would simply be tacked on to their whatever they charged on the credit card and went through. Right. Um, the, uh, like I said, the, if, you go, if you go somewhere where there's a free charging station, do you try to collect a fee from, you know, do you try to collect it from them? Do you lose it out? Um, I said there's three states that are, that are starting to, uh, they're going to take effect in 2023 and 24. So, you know, maybe we'll see how that starts to go. Um, but we'll definitely put um, information about that yeah. in, these, in the uh, other alternatives. We can agree, can we not? But if we had a fee like that, it would at least capture money from the non-residents traveling through the state of Tennessee who 
who ordinarily would be getting the tax money when they stopped in Sevierville right. or wherever they, they stopped to buy gas, they would at least be contributing to maintain some of the roads that they are using and taking advantage of. Yeah, I'd say that's, I'd agree that that's one of the, one of the pros to looking at that as part of the overall solution. Um, you know, and it may be that a number of different things over time put together, you know, solve the, solve the puzzle. Um, and that could be one of them. And it seems to me that the electric vehicles that I've, I know people that own, I've ridden them, probably have the same impact on our roads as those driven by internal combustion engines. So should the legislature consider trying to have some sense of equity so that the people who are using our roads and electric vehicles are paying the equivalent of those using internal combustion engines to maintain the streets and roads they're driving on. I, I mean, I think that's a fair, um, that's a fair point to make. Um, you know, whether whether the EV registration fee should be looked at, you know, that I guess that can really be done at any time. You know, we kind of wanted to point out too, if if you want to make adjustments to that, you know. You, you're going to want to take into consideration the declining revenue from the gas-powered cars, from you know, getting better fuel economy. The what's uh, what's inflation going to do? Um, so, you know, I think that should be part of the overall consideration. And um, one last point, and, and I appreciate your patience with me. It's my understanding that the life expectancy of the batteries in electric vehicles today is about 10 years. And I know this wasn't on point with exactly what we're looking at here, but are you aware of any discussion within the state as to what we're going to do when we begin getting all of these used car batteries that we have to deal with and put them somewhere, and who's going to pay for that? I'm not aware of any discussion within within Tennessee. I know it's a it's a topic that you know throughout the industry, and I think a lot of the a lot of that attention um, is going towards the, the automakers as far as bringing your battery back in for recycling when you kind of like your, your power tools or some of your other things that we have. So, um, yeah, not specific to Tennessee, but um, I think more of an industry thing. Okay. Thank you very much for, for answering my questions. Thank, Thank you for you. your questions, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great discussion. Just a, a question on those um, communities or states that are taxing KW of power. Is there any uh, separation of monies as it relates to improvements to the supply? I, I don't know yet what those, the specifics of, I think, I don't want to speak for all three, um, but it looked like the the revenue was going into um, transportation fund in general. Okay. Um, not um, not anything sort of anything power related, but um, so these were all passed like this summer. That um, I think getting a little more detail of where what they might be using those funds for and how that relates to the rest of their road tax funding. They could be, you know, using um, they could have a kind of a different funding balance than we do. So I'm not to not to belabor the point though i think the it would be incumbent upon us to look at what the impact would be to the uptake or utilization if we have a 130 percent increase in the number of vehicles over a over a multiple two-year period it could be that we couldn't provide those services i guess if you're going to look at it as its entirety that we're also looking based upon consumption too not just the replacement of of gasoline uh, powered vehicles I to to my good friend back there the the Tennessee Department of Transportation testified to uh, chair lady Hazelwood's committee that the electric vehicles are heavier uh, and because of the increased weight uh, it doesn't impact the road uh, as much, it just shortens the life. Now where they calculate the the wear surface of a road to be eight years, 
that it might shorten it to seven years with the increase in the number of electric vehicles, I think. And that, and just that answers the question. Yeah, and that is, that's one of the reasons um, that we talked about just registration fees in general, that there are states that um, have a weight classes for passenger vehicles. So if you've got, you know, a, in Tennessee, it would be, you know, you've got a, a Honda Civic or, you know, a GMC Yukon, it's the same 2375 until you get into like commercial vehicles. Um, so there are some states that have weight classes um, and whether it's gas powered or electric, if your electric vehicle is heavy, it falls into that heavier weight class, you could charge a, a higher registration fee for that vehicle. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mayor Waters. Just, uh, I, I'm wondering in, in light of what we're talking about and the, the, the percentage, you know, I've got some friends in, that provide electricity in these areas and they tell me that there's going to come a time when if enough electric vehicles are out there, the electrical grid can't handle them. And nobody's talking about that. They're talking about charging stations and all kinds of stuff, but nobody's talking about the uh, the folks that furnish the electricity who are saying, I think, uh, all of them that I talk to are saying, there's going to come a time that if there, you know, so many electrical vehicles out there, we're not going to be able to furnish. It's going to uh, the grid is not going to be able to stand that kind of uh, um, uh, kilowatts. You know, an interesting thing that uh, uh, a gentleman from Bucky's told me, Bucky's coming to Sevier County, he said, we're going to have 10 charging stations. And he said, per day, those 10 charging stations are going to cost us as much as an 85,000 square foot building that we're going to be paying in electricity. So, I mean, that's a, that, that may be a limiting factor on the number of vehicles out there. Uh, uh, you know, everybody yeah. wants an electric vehicle, but uh, I think we need to be aware that uh, if something's not done with the electrical grid, I'm not sure that that you know if you can't if you can't charge it, you, it's not going to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. And the, the, a couple things I would that I would add that I would say to that are you know to add our um, as far as the cost of electricity, that's something that. Um, a couple of years ago that TVA through the board passed this, this different rate structure that would apply to elect specifically to electric vehicle charging so that somebody coming, a, you know, a business owner, somebody who wants to put in a charging station doesn't get hit with these spikes of peak power where it's cost prohibitive for them to put in a charger. So that's something that, that they've tried to work out to make it more cost effective for the people providing the chargers. Um, and then we do we do talk about um, struggling to find where it ended up, but um, the uh, you know ro oh it's it's like on the top of page twenty five just kind of says that some stakeholders express concerns that the current electric grid may not be able to support the number of charging stations. It kind of, we had a bunch of detail from some other. A lot of the concern is. Site, really, you know, site specific. It's if, if we want to try to get chargers to these, these locations where people need them the most, you know, those areas may not have the grid capacity, the transformers, the, the supply going to them. Um, so it seems to be that a lot of the, the grid needs are location based. You know, depending on where you're trying to get chargers. Overall, I think the, the long term, when, when TVA has looked at their, you know, 20, 30 year, outlook, the the amount of electricity that they're going to need. Um, they factored in the increase in electric vehicle charging. Um, I think a lot of their optimism has to do with people doing a lot of charging at night at, at their house when you're not using electricity in commercial and industrial things. So they see it as kind of balancing out and not being this massive everybody plugs their car in at the same time kind of thing. Um, but in a lot of locations, those grid concerns are um, coming up already. Uh, uh, just one last question. I wonder if TVA used in their, and you may not know this, when they were determining uh, the whether they could uh, uh, supply the electricity, 
use the 10 percent figure that we've used here or more or less or do you know I, I do not I do not know I haven't looked at that at their um, their IRP in, in a while but um, yeah I'd, I'd be curious to see what what those projections were if that information's in there Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chair Lady Hazelwood. Thank you. I have a question in a minute, but a comment on um, Mayor Waters' um, previous questions. I actually was in a meeting with folks at TVA with part of our, um, our business and utilities subcommittee on Monday and spent a lot of time, you know, talking about these issues. And TVA has... Uh, you know, they're a strategic company. They make long-term plans, but they do have a lot of challenges because you have the increased uh, demands on the grid, not only from electric vehicles, but just population increase, all of those things. At the same time, they're required to uh, eliminate their coal plants. So you have a source of uh, electric pr production going offline. They are looking at... I th I think they see the saving grace as the small nuclear reactors that I think the Clinch River site near Oak Ridge will be the first one, at least in Tennessee. I think they only have two licenses at this point. And, but those are very long-term plays. And then you have the distribution issue. You have, you have to produce the power, but then you have to distribute it and get it. You may have a lot of power in Rogersville, Tennessee, but not nearly enough in Nashville. So, um, you know, there are all those things... I'm confident that they're they're looking at it, but as we all know, these are all projections and estimates, and a lot of things could change those. I was just interested in if you're to me, if you're really looking at a fairness issue, the way to be fair about what you charge people for the road use is the miles traveled on those roads. And I know there are some states that do that. There's all sorts of privacy concerns and. Uh, other issues related to that, but if you could just speak to states that are doing it that way and what we might learn from them. Sure, thank you. Um, so there's there's a list of, or a map that shows states that are um, currently going through these pilot programs, and most of, most of what those have been have been to sort of test out different methods of, of collection, whether it's Oh, um, we've got like 39 to 41. 41 has the map um, with the little green triangles have the individual state has its own pilot project, and then there's some larger um, consortiums discussion about how to coordinate some of this stuff because that's you know, one of the issues with um, choosing to do something different than a fuel tax is Know, people crossing state lines, and then you've got a different system, um, things like that. But um, most of these have been um, either testing out different ways of collecting the information, whether it's do we provide some sort of a, a thing you plug into your car that's automatically updated from time to time? Is it an app on your phone? Is it voluntarily reported? Um, what are the the different ways and what's what's going to work the best um, it, it, that's being tested out and then um, they've been voluntary sort of um, a couple of them it's they've implemented some other sort of a, of a they've, they've implemented some other sort of a fee and you can say well if you want to participate in this program pay by the mile those people end up paying less than what this the blanket fee is um, so those are um, it's really just testing. They're testing the waters. Um, there was additional you know, this additional funding um, that just came out. So those will those will continue, and hopefully we'll see some some best practices start to come together. Is there some organization uh, that is looking at these nationwide overall, evaluating these different programs, or is that just being done simply on a state-by-state -state basis, and it's up to each of us to gather that information? There has not been a push from the federal government to have a national VMT system. Um, we, we, we refer to a, a GAO report that sort of 
looked at all these individual programs and how they've done over the past couple of years and sort of criticized and sort of brought up um, some of the issues. And so they're, I think they're using the states as, you know, as the testing ground and then reviewing what these pilot projects are doing. Um, I would editorialize that given that the, that the federal government hasn't raised the gas tax in 30 years now, um, they'll be slow to roll out a, a, ch a completely different program. Um, but it is, it's going to have to be dealt with. Like I said, the crossing state lines, you're, um, you can't, it complicates things if it changes how you pay for things from one state to the next. So that could be something that these, the two uh, regional multi-state groups here come up with a good idea faster than the federal government. Yes, Julie. Uh, and just follow up, I guess I probably wasn't as clear as I could be in my question, but is there any group, governmental or not-for-profit or think tank, is there anybody out there that's sort of evaluating these different pilots in different states to see, like, uh, you know, I'm just reading Oregon and Utah that have a vehicle mileage tax, but their revenues have are underwater in terms of costs. So, you know, they still didn't pay for their roads. So you either have to increase the tax or, you know, add on a registration or do something. So I'm, I was just curious if there's any kind of objective third party, if you will, that's evaluating um, these studies across the country. I think the some of the research that that we looked at um, came out before these pilot programs were in place. So there, there's been look at, looking at overall nationally what uh, the complications of a VMT. I think this this GAO report from January was the first one to turn and look at the pilot programs specifically. Um, so I think it might be another year or two as some of these play out a little farther um, before they start, they publish some more information and results. Um, I think some of them are just a little too early right now, but we'll do a double check and, and see if there's anything, see um, how much analysis of these has been done so far. And to editorialize a little bit myself, um, you know, I, I understand we have to move carefully, but at the same time, uh, from a political perspective, the sooner you get this in place, when you have fewer electric vehicles, the easier it is to sell. So uh, there is some sense of urgency, I think, about maybe not making final decision, but at least determining which direction the state might go in. Thank you, Chair Lady. Mr. Morio, I believe Director Libbard wanted to respond. I, I would just add, and, and I know this is a group we, we often look to, uh, I believe NCSL is, this is one of their topic areas, and if they're not looking at this, at these pilot programs specifically, I'd be surprised. I, um, they, they, they've listed them. Um, you know, they, that was one of, the, one of our sources of information about what these pilot programs are. Um, I think just that there hasn't been a looking back a lot of a looking back analysis and evaluating them overall, you know, comparing them you know, right. to each other. Um, I'm saying going forward, I, I, I suspect this is something, and we'll we'll reach out to them to see if this is something they, they are going to be tracking, because this is a, the kind of national trend that they tend to tend to look at. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, Director Mayor Frank, and then Councilman Carlisle. I'm going to confess my ignorance here because it's been a long time since I've looked at my utility bill, but it feels that it's on auto pay. Are there not uh, some kind of state taxes or fees on utilities, um, water, electric? Is there not some kind of minimum, like one and a half percent or something like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not an expert. I haven't looked at what the what the tax what the taxing system is on on utility stuff right now. Um, that might be something to look at. I mean, I, I could be wrong. I, it may be something that's local or it may be something that's going directly to the utility. But if the state does already have some level of taxation on there, um, you know, it would seem that if that usage increases, if you have an electric vehicle or you're operating a system, 
um, a commercial system. I don't know if they could get an exemption, but anyhow, I guess it's all going to hinge upon if there is already a tax in place. I will definitely look into it. I think that would be a part when we when we add some information about what these these states are doing with the with the tax per kilowatt hour um, and just reference what what our current um, electricity tax framework looks like. Thanks, Mayor. Councilman Carlisle. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I, I agree with the with the chairwoman that getting something on the books sooner rather than later would, would be much helpful, especially as you look to the private markets to adjust. It's almost like we've gotten into the, the electric business, uh, EV business here in Tennessee with a, a joint partnership that we're very excited about at, at Blue Oval. My, what's interesting is you've got you, you're watching the private markets start to adapt, right? So you look at you look at real estate development. Um, you know, in order to be competitive, everybody, you know, especially if you look around Nashville or Memphis or places that are doing mixed use, you're already starting to see EV start, charging stations start to become a, a competitive advantage, and it's easier for us to capitalize those expenses on the front end. And so, as you're tracking this and you're looking at how do you accelerate the infrastructure piece of it on, on the front end versus the retrofit, meaning, you know, do you want all new developments to build? To, you know, two or do you want to build five, right? And do you enhance that through some sort of, there's already federal credits out there, but you know, is it a state partnership because you wanna see more of that? And then also you've got the retrofit, right? So I own and operate a Shell gas station and I'm seeing my business decline, but I've also got in-store sales. So I make very little on the gas that I sell, but I really make my clip because I'm getting somebody to come into the convenience store. So I may start looking at selling, uh, uh, you know, electricity through a charging station. Um, so those are two of the things that I'll be interested to see is, again, how do you incentivize new development versus retrofitted development as the, as the private markets start to move more that direction? And then to the technology, and, and then what is public and what is private, meaning does the state of Tennessee build its own, you know, I go to a rest area, do I pull up to a state of Tennessee-owned charging station mm -hmm. or is there a third-party contractor that's just going to oversee that for me? At a, re um, at, at a rest area, you actually can't have that's one. That's right. Rest, er rest areas can't have them. They, you can't have uh, you can't have them on federal uh, highway right of way. That was a something that came up. That I thought was interesting that they don't have them at the at the like interstate rest areas for now. Yes, but it, yeah, <laughs> for now. Um, I've surprised. learned as a, I've learned as a local council member dealing with state legislatures, it's the rules of the road can shift. Yeah, uh, I, I was I was surprised by that personally. I just thought I wanted to add um, that. And then, you know, one of the things, at least for, for, for Memphis, that obviously MLGW has done, and I really appreciate the comments about the distribution system. We're in the middle of a $5 billion infrastructure upgrade, you know, of a, of a much overdue weekend distribution system. And that's going to be more problematic, especially in rural areas, as you talk about the cost of transmission lines, et cetera. But for reporting, and I didn't know if California, the, the road usage charge specifically what that is, and I'm going to look at it, but, you know, to, to apply a smart meter, you know, to a local power utility or a local ordinance area is about two, three hundred dollars, right? And so, all that smart meter does is report to a back of house system, and then all of a sudden now I don't have to worry about, you know, you could charge a registration fee to to go ahead and get the, you know, thirty five, forty bucks a year pop, but then you've got the ongoing usage like the gas tax. I don't know why you wouldn't take a look at requiring, and this is why I like the idea of potentially looking getting something on the books because if I'm manufacturing smart meters and I've got a capital plan to manufacture 1,000 over the next five years, I sure would like to know if there's going to be some sort of requirement coming down the pipeline that's easy for me to pay for now as a manufacturer because I can capitalize that expense. And then, of course, if I'm the buyer of that, that charging station, that I can capitalize that as well. It, although the cost of capital is now going up rapidly, uh, it's still typically a, a better way to do it. And my point is, is that I think the smart meter technology might be the best route to go because it, it really is not very expensive on the front end and it's an easy way to, to target usage to a very specific, you know, charging station A at this address utilize this many kilowatts and now I as the receiving or reporting agency have a place to, to put that data and then I as the buyer know exactly what I'm paying for that electricity when I put my credit card in to pay for it. Um, so I'll be really interested to, to, to see how those things juxtapose. Um, but it is incredible. We're on this really interesting horizon um, as we see this paradigm shift uh, from diesel and gas in, into the electric future. And I also do want to follow up. Uh, I forget who brought up the point about the, the lithium batteries. I, I understand that the private markets, meaning the major manufacturers, are, are 
unless there is some sort of federal legislation or agreement them of understanding, I'm not as optimistic that that, that issue is going to be addressed. I mean, it's great to have, quote, clean energy, but lithium batteries in those cars are not clean. And so to not have a plan or at least have somebody take a peek at if the federal government doesn't regulate oversight, what is the state of Tennessee going to do so that people are not tossing batteries into um, landfills where they're not supposed to be? And so that's something that I think just has to be considered as, as they, again, as they start to unwind and, and need to be recycled. So, um, but I'm really ex interested and excited to see see how this starts to play out, not only locally, but but nationally. It's, it's fascinating. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Chairman Crawford and then Mayor Anderson. Yeah, you can you can get back to me or you can give the answer to the vice chairman and he can pass it out to the committee. But my concern, is there been any thought given to, uh, I know over the long run it would probably save our counties and cities money, but what the initial cost would be to have to adapt this over uh, through the fleet of, uh, of automobiles that we have, school buses, fire trucks, ambulances, all these things, and how many, one charging station, how many cars can that charge over a 24-hour period so you could kind of get some breakdown of you've got a hundred cars in this fleet how many of those charging stations would you have to have just to save time you can get back to me okay yeah I'll I'll, I'll reach out to you and, and get some details for that thank you chairman Mayor Anderson you can get back to your report, but you've made no mention at all in the area of ag. Uh, uh, it'll be a matter of a time till the agricultural equipment uh, will be battery run also. Uh, I would think the state legislators would want to address that issue up front to the best of their ability. Uh, most ag products in that area do have a discount or ag exempt in some way, so you're going to have to deal with that. And since ag is still a very large portion of our state revenue, I would think you'd want to deal with that now than later, even though I understand um, Patsy's comment about wanting to get it on the book sooner than later. But no, I have heard no one talk about the ag community. Yeah, and I haven't personally, I think in our research, come across much discussion of um, the the equipment, you know, elect, you know, the equipment being going electric, but I, I, it could just be that we weren't really looking for it. Um, well, most of the large fields now, even in our county, which is considered ag, is uh, GPS. I mean, the only reason you got a driver's in there to right in case something goes wrong. I mean, the wheat, the beans, corn, all that now is GPS, and. Uh, you know, the driver doesn't even need to be in there. It's just a matter of time they won't. Yeah, and I think that um, the one issue related to, you know, to rural areas and agricultural is the issue of power of the power supply, of getting adequate power out to areas that, you know, currently don't have it, um, and whether a lot of that comes through distributed solar, um, different means of getting more of that power out to those places that are eventually going to need it. You're absolutely correct, Mr. Mayor. And as follow-up, you get in some of those large areas, even even what's happened in Florida today, and we all hate it, but there's a mass exodus of pe people leaving town. Um, I'm sure they're leaving town on gasoline, diesel engines, not on electric vehicles, but on a mass exodus like that, unless federal law has changed, they're not able to have those charging stations. You've got some real issues. So that's a public safety. I, I agree. I want to get it on the books. Let's get a lot of these things answered. How are we going to handle it from landfills to ag and all the other things? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, sir. Well, just to confirm what Mayor Anderson said as well about Ag, Loudoun County itself is a very heavily agricultural-based county. And <clears throat> throughout the study, I see a lot of, of, of language, for, you know, and, and how does the state increase, you know, the revenue to keep up with what we need to have, and, I, and that's fine. But I think there has to be some language, and, and it has to be very specific, but there has to be something to show the impact. Because I know Loudoun County, some of these uh, alternative 
money raising schemes, I guess, or they look great on paper. But I know particularly my county, we have a lot of families that are at or below the poverty level. And, you know, any drastic thing right now, gas being what it is now, any change to that or any increase on that is could be devastating. It's hard enough to get people to work now and to make it more expensive to go to work, I think would be detrimental to a lot of our rural counties. And so I'd like to see some just uh, maybe an impact on any of these on the average on the average family. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and you reminded me of of, of uh, one of the things that, you know, when we looked at the difference between you know, a fuel tax or th uh, like a registration fee, you pay your fuel tax every week or so when you go and fill up a pump, you know, you're paying two bucks um, each time you fill up the thing. If you're just hit with a $300 registration fee one time a year, um, you know, that's that's a big problem for a lot of, you know, for a lot of families, for a lot of people. So um, changing to something like that, um, you certainly want to consider the impact on what that would mean to people's ability to pay. Thank you for those comments, Mayor Bradshaw. Um, any other comments from the Tasser Commission? Mr. Morio, thank you for your work and thank you for this draft. We look forward to hearing the final. Thank you, I appreciate all the discussion and, and uh, questions. All right, that takes us uh, to tab number six, uh, Public Chapter 497, Acts of 2021, Water Recreation Resources, a draft report uh, from Ms. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, members. My name is Jennifer Barry, and I'm presenting the draft report addressing water recreation resources as directed by Public Chapter 497, Acts of 2021. The public chapter is included, included as Appendix A on page 85 of the draft report. It includes 10 specific points that we were to study and that are addressed in the draft to help state agencies identify the best ways to manage the state's resources and address challenges given the evolving recreational uh, use of the state's waterways. We will present the final report for your approval at the December meeting and it is due by December 31st of, of this year. And like other states, Tennessee is experiencing an increase in outdoor recreation as more people are enjoying the state's natural resources and participating in a variety of activities such as fishing, hunting, and paddling in non-motorized vessels, which we call paddlecraft. Uh, like canoes, kayaks, paddle boards, rafts, and tubes. A few benefits from outdoor recreation are improved fitness, mental health and well-being, jobs and economic benefits from tax revenue for local governments, especially in rural communities where outdoor recreation often happens. But the increase in outdoor recreation also brings challenges like user conflicts, congestion, insufficient infrastructure, or inadequate access to waterways, safety concerns, trespassing, litter, and property damage. <clears throat> the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, TWRA, has regular, regulatory and enforcement authority over all boating on public waters and owns or manages over 200 boat access ramps in the state. Um, in response to the challenges from the increase in water recreation and some stakeholders' concerns about congestion and access issues, the General Assembly passed Public Chapter 969, Acts of 2018, authorizing the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is TWRA's governing body, uh, to establish rules for outfitters, and those are the businesses that rent non-motorized vessels to the public on public waters in the state. The Fish and Wildlife Commission then passed rules requiring the outfitters to obtain a free permit to operate their businesses and they must identify each vessel that they own. In 2019, Public Chapter 347 required these commercial paddlecraft outfitters to submit data to TWRA three times a year about their operations, including the number of trips that are made and which waterways they use. The agency began collecting this data in 2022. TWRA does not collect data from private paddlers, um, those paddlers who own their own paddlecraft rather than renting um, paddlecraft from an outfitter. Although data hasn't been collected, stakeholders say that in recent years there has been an increase in private paddlers who along with other user groups are part of the state's water resource management challenges. More data about all recreational user groups could help TWRA and the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, TDEC, 
uh, the two main state agencies that manage recreation and waterway access uh, better determine their needs and priorities, including how those user groups contribute to the challenges and where the state's limited resources could be best deployed to manage waterway access areas. TDEC manages waters that are encompassed within state parks and access to waterways that flow through or border state parks. In 2022, TDEC started charging 3% of gross receipts for all business conducted within state parks, including paddlecraft outfitters. TWRA also proposed fees in 2019 um, but didn't adopt them because of resistance from outfitters, and staff have said, TWRA staff has said, that TWRA would implement its own database fee structure in the future to generate needed revenue. They say they need additional, rev uh, additional funds to manage their boat access areas and waterways. However, it is unclear how much additional funding agencies might need to help manage waterways uh, because of the increased recreational use. With more robust data, state agencies could determine how much is needed and then explore potential methods to generate new revenue. There are examples from federal agencies and other states that have charged a variety of fees on non-motorized watercraft and dedicated tax revenue for waterway management. Fees can be charged um, for commercial and private use, boat registration, or for waterway access permits. The TASR staff estimated the revenue from potential fees and taxes in some hypothetical scenarios, and those are in tables six, seven, eight, and nine on pages 60, 62, 66, and 68 in the draft report. Based on available information and various assumptions, the potential revenue generated from different types of fees uh, or dedicated tax revenue varies widely, from as little as $3,700 uh, generated from permits to access specific rivers to as much as $91 million generated from dedicated revenue from taxes on certain recreational, uh, certain recreational goods, which is similar to what the state of Texas does. Regardless of the fees or taxes used, requirements from multiple government agencies is a concern, and although they do not seem to be too common, fees or tax exemptions and credits for commercial outfitters are a potential strategy to avoid uh, burdensome fees. For example, Oregon allows limited exemptions from its waterway access permits. The original launch fee that TWRA proposed in 2018 included a credit for outfitters uh, that paid an access fee to another agency. But those rules passed without the fees. Like any other business in the state, Commercial paddlecraft outfitters are required to pay taxes to various government entities. According to the Tennessee Department of Revenue, from 2017 through 2021, commercial paddlecraft outfitters paid a total of approximately $33.4 million in state sales tax and $12.9 million in local sales tax. And respondents to the 2022 uh, TASSER survey of commercial paddlecraft outfitters in the state, they said, uh, the respondents said they pay various fees and taxes to federal, state, and local governments. In addition to TWRA and TDEC, multiple agencies regulate Tennessee's waterways for many uses and have boat access areas they manage on their lands in the state. Those agencies include the Tennessee Valley Authority, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, and local governments across the state. And there's a map on page 26 in the report that shows uh, government land in the state. And table two on page 27 summarizes the various jurisdictions. Uh, the agencies all have authority to require businesses to have permits or contracts and pay fees to use waterway ramps or areas within their jurisdictions. And some do, uh, some local governments do as well, uh, like Nashville, Knoxville, and Knox County. At times, regulation of the state's waterways by so many different government entities can be confusing. Better coordination and communication among the government agencies, non-government organizations, and various user groups could help minimize potential confusion and burdensome fees and requirements. Although TWRA, TWRA has a new regulatory role in the paddlecraft community, 
State law currently doesn't require a representative of the boating, paddling, or outfitter community to serve on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. In 2019, the Commercial Paddlecraft Advisory Committee was created with the intent to include paddlecraft outfitters in discussions and resolving issues. The members of that committee are appointed by the TWRA Executive Director and must include a majority of commercial paddlecraft outfitters and other stakeholders. The focus of that committee is on issues related to the outfitters rather than discussing and resolving um, boating or water recreation issues more broadly. Other states have boards with more diverse representation and broader objectives, and these boards help with coordination between government agencies and stakeholders and bring people together to discuss and resolve water recreation issues. Florida and Pennsylvania are two examples of, of states that have boating advisory entities that serve this purpose. 16 other states have outdoor recreation offices, task forces or policy advisors, which address outdoor recreation uh, rather than just focusing on boating. In conclusion, involving diverse stakeholders who use Tennessee's water recreation resources directly in the planning process would likely help manage conflicts and ensure better policies, ensure that state policies better reflect evolving trends and needs in outdoor recreation. An example of uh, potential co collaboration would be the development of water trails or blue ways that could provide more waterway access and economic development benefits for communities. And gathering more data about all types of water recreational users could help TWRA and TDEC determine how to best manage Tennessee's waterways and access areas, and best use the state's limited resources, and determine what new revenue uh, sources, if any, are needed. For these reasons, the draft report has uh, four recommendations. It recommends that state agencies with jurisdiction over public waterways in Tennessee's should gather more robust data on the recreational use of water resources across the state and use that data for strategic planning. The next recommendation is to continue to take a collaborative approach to strategic planning with multiple agencies and consider a statewide task force to address water recreation issues and work through conflicts. This could potentially be accomplished by transitioning the existing Commercial Paddlecraft Advisory Committee to a permanent statewide boating advisory committee with representation and objectives for all affected stakeholder groups or by establishing a state office of outdoor recreation. Uh, the next recommendation is to continue to develop existing and new partnerships to improve access to waterways. Uh, for example, new relationships between government agencies and the nonprofit organizations that are already building and maintaining access areas and doing education and training activities uh, could be developed and existing partnerships could be strengthened or formalized. And finally, the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission, which regulates commercial non-motorized vessel outfitters, should consider including a member of the commercial non-motorized vessel outfitter community on the commission. I thank you for listening, and I appreciate your questions and comments. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Any questions or comments from members of the commission for Ms. Barry? <laughs> Chairman Williams. Uh, no, everyone's trying to get out the door. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> as a fly fisherman on the Caney Fork River, this is a really big problem. Uh, lots of people there had opportunity to talk to TWRA and the paddlecraft industry. I do think it's important your recommendation as it relates to getting someone in the paddlecraft community on the committee is probably the most important thing uh, here. I do think it's important that they do that because currently they don't have a voice on the committee. Uh, I do think that until such time that they do have a voice on the committee that it it would be an overreach for TWRA to begin to provide or, or, or implement a user fee. Mm -hmm. um, our founding fathers didn't like that very much either. And so I appreciate this. I do think one of the concerns that I have, though, is if there has to be a way to separate what you call the blue ways from other uses so that 
the the waterways, and particularly the moving waters of the state, are able to be shared by all people. I think one of the challenges is there's not a lot of discussion about the challenges there. You can, as a paddler or a fly fisherman, you can be in the river and a flotilla of 150 paddle bo- paddle uh, craft come by, and so it's there's no divergence or no communication between the entities and the only way to do that I think is to have them on the committee I, I appreciate the report I think it's much needed uh, hopefully we can implement the, the changes that you're talking about because I think uh, it's well past time to do that so thank you thank you thank you chairman senator Yerber. Uh thank you very much uh, and thank you for the report Ms. Perry I was struck by uh, there's in the report, it, it, it mentions that 25 um, percent of in-state and out-of-state visitors, you know, in, that are traveling in Tennessee, are participating in outdoor activities, nature-related activities. I'm curious how other states have incorporated the role of their sort of tourism development offices in this in this space. That's a great question. We didn't look specifically at tourism offices in other states, but we did talk to our Office of Rural Tourism, and they're this is um, they're very interested in this topic. Uh, we're open to helping with a statewide committee for outdoor recreation of some sort. So um, I'm not sure about other states, but but it is it's an important topic for uh, rural communities. It's it's important economic development opportunity for them. So the, our Office of Rural Tourism is very interested in being involved. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll stop there, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Ms. Berry, again, uh, thank you for this report. I'm thankful that the words could or should did not appear in your recommendations. You just said continue. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mayor Allen. So the, the Office of Rural Tourism... You just mentioned that. Mm-hmm. What what does that what umbrella does that fall under? They're part of the Department of um, Tourist Development, and that okay. office was created. Um, Governor Lee, when Governor Lee came into office, that's in, so twenty that twenty nineteen. That office was created, so it's pretty new. Okay, <clears throat> okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I have been corrected. The director expertly noticed the one should, which preceded all of the continues. So I, I commend you for that. I, I do have one question. Much uh, well, in, in the recommendations, you said gather more robust data. You talk about collaborative approaches and new partnerships and bullet point number three. Uh, but one issue that's not mentioned in the draft is how much of the commercial use that's been talked about is occurring from private access versus public launch sites. Um, That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Possibly much of this is from private sites. And is it possible that when we get together again for the final draft that uh, we estimate how much of this is public versus private? Yes, that's a great question. It quite a bit is from private access. Great, thank you. Um, Any other? Ms. Berry, thank you for that report. I'm very grateful. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in a few months. That uh, takes us to what appears to me, Mr. Director, to be the end of today's session. Uh, and do you have any closing words of wisdom? Well, I mean, if, if, if everyone wants to hang around, we can go ahead and <laughs> no, um, the uh, objection. The only the only comment, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, is that you feel free to leave your, your docket material here. It's OK to leave it here overnight. And otherwise, we will reconvene at 8.30 in the morning. We are adjourned until 8.30. Thanks, everyone.